Welcome back, everyone, to the show. As I mentioned in the introduction, so excited to bring back Shane Ryan, author of a brand new book that we're going to talk all about today, The Cup They Couldn't Lose. We're going to talk all about this fantastic new book, Shane, that you have put out uh, just recently. Shane, first and foremost, how are things going with you? Things are great, Adam. Yeah. Um, the book is done. Uh, and it's been really fun doing all these interviews and telling people about it and you know, seeing people's reactions has been really cool. You and I talked initially with their first book, Slaying the Tiger, which was absolutely just took the world by the golf world by storm and maybe even the entire world, Shane. You never know. And <laughs> yeah. it, uh, it just it opened a lot of doors in a lot of people's eyes, especially the casual golf fan who might not have known a lot about these personas in the game. Uh, accolades came from all different part, uh, parts of the world for that book. And I imagine that you're still very proud of that uh, offering to the golf world. Yeah, it's funny to think about it. It's seven years ago. Uh, I don't know why I just thought of this, but I was reading, I think it was like some kind of podcast where they talked about how your cells change to the point that every seven years you're an entirely new person. Like every little <laughs> from your skin to your organs, every cell is no longer the same after seven years. So I'm a completely different human being, apparently, than when when that book came out. Uh, but no, I am still proud of it. Uh, yeah, there's there's parts. It's funny, like sometimes I'll be writing something and I'll go. Like I know, I know there's something about Jason Day that I want here, and I can't remember exactly. I'll just go to the book, and there'll <laughs> be something there. Uh, so no, yeah, that was really satisfying, and um, you know, it's a lot of work. Obviously, a book. Apparently, it takes me seven years to work up ahead of steam to to do another one. <laughs> this no. one took some time. I remember you saying it. What maybe two years straight of, uh, and that's a abbreviated timeline too, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah, I think in 2019 in the summer, I signed the deal, you know, we're going to write this book about the Ryder cup. Obviously we thought it would be in 2020 at that point. Um, mm -hmm. something happened. I can't remember, but something <laughs> happened and <laughs> little thing. so it feels like it might've been big. I can't remember, but uh, yeah. So no, then the pandemic delayed it for a year. Um, which, you know, it was, it gave me another year to research just in terms of my own personal process. Uh, so, but yeah, then we did 2021 and the crazy thing about this book was I had to write it in a month after the Ryder Cup was over. Right. And that was that was quite a trial. Uh, that was really something. But I think it was good in a weird way. It wasn't like it was very stressful. But in terms of the written, the quality of the book and the final product I put out, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I was just like it forced you to get all your research and just get it on paper and then, you know, work like crazy. There was no time to think. And so what a crazy process. I was listening to an interview you did with um, with Brendan and Andy over at the Shotgun Star, and you had mentioned that at one point you would just go into, I think you rented out an office, if I remember correctly, and yeah. you tried to get 6,000 words out at the start. You wanted to kind of like do the whole shotgun, pun intended, at, at, up front. Uh, was mm -hmm. that process working at the time? Did you have to amend it a little bit? There's not really much of an option. <laughs> you know, when you uh, when you go, OK, they want I forget what they wanted from the book. It was I think 75 to 90,000 words was what they it was like, sort of like this is in your contract. This is how many words this book should be. Mm -hmm. So when you did the math, it was like, well, I got 30 days, <laughs> 90,000 words. Yeah, I like, got oh, at least 3000 a day. Um, but no, you know, the book ended up being even longer, which is the story of my life. Everything I write is longer than anyone asked for. But uh, but it's still it's like a pretty short book still um, by nonfiction standards. But, yeah, it was it was just hit the ground running every day. There was no time to think about it. One story I told that I'm sure you heard is I wrote the Steve Stricker chapter and I lost it all, lost right. it all due to computer glitch. Yeah. And it was just like a thing of like, even when that happens, there's no time to think about it. There's no there's no time to feel sorry for yourself. There's nothing. It's It's like, go, 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 go. Um, and the book weirdly, it like takes shape. I, I guess, yeah, maybe I'm someone who benefits from like having a deadline and having a little pressure on, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think if you give me four months, I probably wouldn't work for a month <laughs> and I, and it would be, I'd put myself in the same situation, you know? So, yeah, uh, it was, uh, looking back on it, it's like, you feel really proud of it that you did mm -hmm. it at the time. You're like, I can't wait till this month is over. I wish I could fast forward time. Yeah, I could only imagine. And the book, of course, we're, yeah. we're talking about is The Cup They Couldn't Lose, America, the Ryder Cup, and the Long Road to Whistling Straits. And uh, as I mentioned before we got going here, I'm still working my way through it. I just love your writing style because uh, when I read what you write, as well as others um, of your ilk, and it, it's almost like going through memory lane a little bit. I remember yeah. hearing about all these stories. I remember, you know, obviously anyone who follows golf 
uh, for more than five minutes remembers, you know, the Tiger car crash. You remember all the stuff with Patrick Reed and, and so on and so forth. But some of the things I wasn't as well versed in was the history of the Ryder Cup which yeah, you do a really yeah. good job up front to kind of set that primer. How how much fun was it for you to kind of go digging into the annals of uh, Ryder Cup lore? Yeah, it was great. You know, it was great. It was something that even when I started this process, I thought I knew a lot about the Ryder Cup, but what I actually knew could fit in a thimble. And, and you know, you get deep into it because it's like, you know, you have this idea of like Europe has dominated for a very long time. They've, they've been winning for 40 years. Why? Right. I mean, like a simple question, like why or what happens, what happened to let them dominate? And so going back to that, it's just as a for instance, like learning about Tony Jacklin, learning about the system they put in place, learning about how the Ryder Cup was almost dead Mm -hmm. uh, in the late 70s because it wasn't competitive and nobody would sponsor the European team. You know, stuff like that was pardon me. It was just uh, completely mind blowing to me. And luckily, it's an era where the people are still alive. Mm -hmm. Everything changed in the early 1980s. And so Tony Jacklin's an old man now. There's a lot of people who are old men. Shouldn't say everybody. You know, it would have been great to talk to Seve Ballesteros, people like that. But um, but yeah, I think there is still a living history there where if it had been 10 years older, it might, you know, that might not be the case. And so I felt like I was kind of getting in sort of at the right time to to learn and to talk to people. And there's so much more to do. You know, this is just but yeah, learning, learning that history, I think, was the most rewarding part because I didn't know about it. And I think a lot of people don't even even people you would say, oh, these people are big Ryder Cup fans. Right. Even they some of them are you tell them and they go, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, well, even the four meetings that you illustrate in the beginning of the book, you know, the yeah. four critical meetings, I think you called it and how Seve was basically like, OK, I help you to, to yeah. Tony Jacklin. I mean, I just, uh, I was sitting back and I had to laugh and my wife was looking at me like, you're reading a, a, a book about golf. Why are you laughing? I'm like, this is just such, <laughs> it's such a little anecdote that you would have never known. And it's the type of stories that you want to hear. Uh, and thank you for bringing it to the golf world itself. And you had mentioned about how the, the Ryder cup almost literally died. It, it was just, they were losing sponsors, uh, learning all of that. Did that give you a better appreciation perhaps of the Ryder cup that we have today? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so going way back really quickly, and this is something you haven't got to in the book yet. It's only mentioned briefly, but uh, the Ryder Cup has been on death's door a few times. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of them was will be no surprise to people is after World War Two. It didn't happen during World War Two. So 1937 was the last Ryder Cup before the war. 1947 comes and you know, Great Britain, the UK is completely ravaged. You know, it's been hit by German bombs for four years. They've lost all their people. They're at war. Nobody's thinking, oh, hey, let's send 12 golfers over to the United States to have a Ryder Cup. It's not in the priority list. And they didn't have the money to do it because, again, you know, they took a huge beating there. Um, This guy, this guy named Robert Hudson in Portland, Oregon, who was never a golfer until a doctor told him, hey, you know, you're, you're not healthy. You should pick up something like golf. Picked it up. He's this rich, rich grocery store owner, basically. Gets obsessed with the game, becomes over-obsessed with it, right? Brings the U.S. Open to Portland, has a ton of influence, uses it all to bear. 1947 comes along, and he gets it in his head. I want to bring the Ryder Cup back. And I don't think anybody was thinking about the Ryder Cup then. So not only did he say that, but when U.K. and Great Britain came back and said, you know, we have no money, he paid for everything. He paid for all 12 guys to take a ship over, met them in New York, threw them a you know big party at the Waldorf Astoria, traveled on them with a train all the way across the country to get to Portland and they had this Ryder cup and, you know, the U S won 12 to one, the U S had much better players, you know, it it was, you know, but what it did was kept it going. And then two years later they did it again and and so on and so forth. So then, yeah, fast forward to the part you're talking about where you get to the late seventies and this has been, you know, Ryder cup started in 1927. The U S wins, all but one or two times. I mean, it's mm. complete, complete domination. And it's getting to the point where we're entering the sort of what we would consider the modern world where sponsorship is a big deal and you have to make money at these mm-hmm. things. Otherwise, it's going to fall. And this big bank, the Sun Alliance Bank, which had sponsored the European Ryder Cup team, dropped out um, after 1981 because it transitioned to Europe and they still didn't win. They still got killed by the Americans. And mm-hmm. they said, you know, enough is enough. Why are we throwing our money at this thing that nobody cares about? It's not competitive. So the uh, executive secretary of the British PGA was tasked with finding sponsors, basically, Uh, and he couldn't do it. He spent a year and a half doing it and he couldn't do it. And you talked about the four meetings. One of them was when he went up to Perth, Scotland and Mm -hmm. met this guy, Raymond McKell, who ran a whiskey company called Bell Scotch Whiskey, who I mean, and we're talking months before the 83 Ryder Cup. 
who said, okay, yeah, I'll sponsor you. I'll give you 300, 300,000 pounds to do this, which they were like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Nobody right. else offered us a penny. Yeah, we'll <laughs> certainly take your 300,000 pounds. But that was kind of like out of nowhere. There was no reason to expect it. Um, they went to the PGA of America in the US and said, well, this guy wants to do it, but he wants his sponsorship. He wants his name up in Florida, even, you know, at right. your event. And right. they couldn't say no because the alternative was not to have a Ryder Cup. Mm -hmm. So they did it, you know, and then and this thing. But along with this, it's, a, it's only a two year deal, right? You only sponsor two Ryder Cups and then you're back in the mess that you were in before unless you turn it around quickly and it becomes competitive. Mm -hmm. And so they go to this guy, Tony Jacklin, who is, this, you know, was a great player, but he was, you know, now in his 40s. He was somebody who was disgruntled with the Ryder Cup because he'd been left off a team. Mm -hmm. He was not happy. And they, out of, they, they had this long debate. Should the Ryder Cup captain be like a lifetime achievement award or should it go to someone younger who maybe can do something? And it was a really tense and long debate. Three, four months before the Ryder Cup, they go to Jacqueline and he accepts the job with all these demands that they say yes to. Mm -hmm. And again, he's got to turn it around overnight. And I think one of the great sports stories – of all time, is certainly one of the great golf stories is that he does it almost mm -hmm. immediately. He transforms right. things. They win, you know, they almost win in Florida in 83 when they go. Um, and then they come to the Belfry in 85 and they win. And then momentum comes, history comes, and all of a sudden Europe is the better team for 30 years about. So it's really cool. Yeah. It, and it's been just that dominance that a lot of people, at least our age, because I think we're similar in age, uh, remember yeah. from the European side. And, you know, it's so interesting for the casual fan who watches this a spectacle every couple of years. And they say, well, that's America has Tiger Woods. America has Phil Mickelson. America yeah. has all these these great singles players, but they keep losing. So when you were going through your research and, and speaking with others, I mean, why what did the Europeans do so differently as a group were these uh, this group of, of uh, Euro stars that we don't necessarily know here stateside played so well while the individuals who we do know so well on the American side did not yeah. in this context. So, you know, the, you can go into granular detail on a lot of things and we can and I will. But the overarching thing and uh, the the simple like 10 second explanation is mm -hmm. that Europe and Tony Jacklin understood to treat this as a team sport in a way that U.S. couldn't get. U.S. Mm -hmm. especially couldn't get because they were better. They had better players in America. And they thought, you know, like a lot of people thought, a lot of people still think, and even the U.S. Ryder Cup leadership thought until the mid-2010s, because we have better talent, it's inevitable that we're going to win this thing because right. we'll just play better golf with them and that will be it. Now, if you were talking about basketball or something, you wouldn't say, well, we have the best players. We're going to win. You would know that there is an element of team strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a team with lesser athletes could beat a team with better athletes if they have a cohesive system. That makes sense in a team sport where everything's interdependent. In golf, it's harder to see that and it's very tempting not to see it, to go – Really, it's just everybody hitting their own golf ball. Like, but right. as it turns out, there there are many many things you can do to foster a team environment, to give yourself advantages. One of the things Tony Jacklin did, which now we see all the time, but it took the U.S. like about twenty five years to catch up, is you know setting up the course to benefit his team. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so in eighty five, the first time they won, you know the U.S. What's the difference in the U.S.? Well, on the PGA Tour, the greens are really fast. They're really good at chipping because there's growth around the greens. Fairways are more wide open. So Jacqueline waters the greens down so they're slow as can be, mm -hmm. shaves everything around the greens so nobody can ship anymore to take away their strength. It tightens up the fairways and grows the grass like crazy in the rough. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden, these are very, very uncomfortable situation for the U.S. They're completely not ready for it. They sort of understand what's happening, but it takes them utterly by surprise. Um, other things like... OK, so Jacqueline's big complaint as a player was that they were basically second class citizens. They weren't traveling in style. They didn't have good clothes. Mm -hmm. They didn't feel like a team together. Right. And so he made sure to take care of all of that. They had the best facilities. Their wives and caddies could come with them. Things like that. Captain's picks. He, he uh, ahead of time was very smart about he wanted as many as possible captain's picks. And mm -hmm. he was ahead of his time in that. Um, and it goes on and on in terms of, you know, what personalities are going to work well together in pairings? What's the tactics there? There's just a lot of stuff like that that they thought of first. And, you know, the book goes into all the details on sure. that. But then there's something else that I think is really interesting, which is that, OK, you've got this history where America has been better. America has the better players back then. We still have the better players today for the most part. Um, and 
what the dynamic this creates is on the European side, one of wanting to prove themselves against America, mm. wanting to test themselves and prove that they're equal. And all they need is a little bit of hope and a little bit of a system to let them know they can compete. So in 1983, when they lose, um, barely the Americans, oh, the Americans won again. They're fine. They're happy. In the European locker room, everyone's glum until Seve Ballesteros marches in and saying, this is a victory. This is a victory. We showed him what we're going to do. We're going to win. And he's got people crying and he's crying as he's marching up and down. And, you know, like – a scene that would have been unimaginable for an mm-hmm. American fan. Even now, I try to, I, it's hard to explain because it's something I didn't understand. But if you're a U.S. fan, try to imagine saying, I can't wait to go up against England in golf because we have to prove ourselves. Right. It just would never happen because we are such a big country with such a strong infrastructure and such a rich country and so many good athletes that we take it for granted that we're the best because that has how it's been. That they're not the best. And so they have this like fighting spirit where taking down America is really something special to them. And the other thing is because they're at that deficit in talent, they know they need to think of other ways to win. Mm-hmm. And that's why they did. That's why, you know, history makes it. So a figure like Jacqueline comes up and strategizes. It's the only way possible they're going to do it. Now, America, on the other hand, all these years of victory produce a kind of arrogance in them and a sort of um, stasis or, you know, like a status quo thing where even when they see what Europe is doing and even when they kind of get it, they're a little bit too entrenched and too too satisfied with themselves to adjust until they get humiliated at enough times. And enough times equals like a dozen. <laughs> right? Right, like, right. It, it takes all the way to Glen Eagles before they stop and say enough, enough, enough. We can't keep losing like this. Uh, so, yeah, they have two things going on like that that are, you know, it just it really almost inevitable based on their histories. Yeah, it's a, it's fascinating to watch, and that's a great rundown, and and I can't wait to get to those uh, p- parts in the book. Uh, America, when you think of the Olympics, you think of you know the dominance and the medal count all the time, and so something that you touched on mm-hmm. too, it's where it's almost like, oh, America is always going to dominate, and there's almost this mentality that that's always going to be true until it isn't, like you had mentioned, uh, and then you see the great minds come out, and everyone talks so much about you know Paul Azinger's pod system for example. And yeah. I would imagine that you may or may not argue that that is a derivative, if I understand correctly, of what Tony Jacklin had already been thinking about years before. You got to put people together that actually like each other. It's true. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, Europe, there may be a sense that Europe is a little better at coming together for this common cause of defeating the Americans because of the underdogs. Well, Azinger came of age and played of age in a time when the U.S. was trying to copy that in these kind of rudimentary ways where like we want all 12 guys to come and be passionate together. Azinger realized it's not going to happen. I mean, these mm-hmm. are like essentially selfish people. We both know professional golfers. This is a selfish sure. sport, you know, and so it, it, particularly, you know, you're looking at conservative Americans coming right. and playing it for the most part. Mm-hmm. They're not going to be like this thing where, you know, it's not going to happen. But what Azinger thought is like, OK, if 12 is too many, what about four? And he got this from watching a Navy SEALs documentary, Mm -hmm. you know, like the SEALs break into these little small teams and they Mm -hmm. get really tight and everything. Um, So he said, yeah, if we have four people, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's doable. And it worked brilliantly in 20, in 2008 at Valhalla. Then of course, America being America, they forgot it for about six years, but you you know, like, (laughs) but it did, it it did, it worked great. And then what Azinger did is the foundation of a lot of the stuff the task force eventually picked up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stuff you see today, he was our Jacqueline. He was the guy who had the idea first. The difference is their Jacqueline got to captain four times in a row and set the system in place. Whereas Azinger was, you know, he was out after one, but yeah, it's, um, these things, that in particular is brilliant because it's an, an American solution to an American mm-hmm. problem rather than trying to just copy some kind of European passion template or something. Sure. So it took a lot. It took a lot of thinking like that to change things around. I feel that the Ryder Cup is this event that has had many turning points along its history. You had just discussed a few along the time. Uh, one for the American side, of course, was the infamous Tom Watson, Phil Mickelson press conference. You know, that was a turning point. Um, yeah. Uh, another turning point that I imagine probably impacted even your process writing this book was, of course, the pandemic. Uh, the Ryder Cup had to get pushed a year. Uh, do you feel that these turning points add to the allure of the event or is it just something that happens alongside it? No, I think they add to the allure of it because, um, yeah, like you said, these historical turning points or focal points uh 
they they're what make it interesting because it's right. the way in which things transform and it tends to happen quickly uh as quickly as as europe started to become good jacqueline i mean that's how quickly the u.s started to become really good when they finally focused up after glenn eagles um and yeah like phil mickelson was a big part of that turning point mm. there needed to be a come to jesus moment and he made sure that there would be by publicly Right. making a big deal out of it, you know, and he had his own motivations. Like he was insulted by Tom Watson and we all know Phil, sure. he, he can hold a grudge with the best of them. Uh, and so, you know, that was part of it, but it did what it was supposed to do. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Like the, the pandemic, you know, it's interesting. I don't know if in the history of the Ryder cup, it's necessarily a turning point. It's definitely a huge event, like the nine 11 attacks that end up delaying sure. the Ryder cup for a year. But um, what you can look at, you can look at it very much as an adaptation point where, both captains had the opportunity to add captain's picks. And I, I just think this is very interesting that historically, when you look at the data, captain's picks perform better than mm -hmm. the guys who qualify at the bottom of the qualification list. So, the, you know, that's just the numbers. That's what they tell us. And that means, obviously, more captain's picks are better, right? I mean, it's like very, very simple. And so when the pandemic came, Stricker had the opportunity to increase to six captain's picks. Mm -hmm. He took it because he was listening to his numbers, guys. And then when they said, oh, OK, well, it's not going to be held in 2020. It's 2021. You can go back if you want. He mm -hmm. said, no, thank you. We'll stick with six. And by the way, they're sticking with six in the President's Cup and the Ryder Cup. It's six from now on. That's a permanent change they've made. Hmm. Well, Padre Harrington in Europe, he actually had gone down from four in Paris to three, his logic was that captain's picks feel too much pressure because they're compelled to perform, hmm. which, you know, nothing backs up, no numbers back up. He didn't increase from three when the pandemic hit, it, you know, so yeah, it right. just shows you like a, 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 something like COVID-19 forces you to adapt, but it presents these weird little opportunities within it. And Stricker and his guys and the American system seized on those and, and Europe happened to kind of flounder away. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, now that I think about it, it could be a big turning point, especially if the U.S. were to win in 2023. You know, it's it, when you talk about like uh, Harrington, you talk about Stricker and past uh, captains on both sides. I've always wondered what goes through their minds as they're planning this. They talk about such a big uh, job this is, obviously because they're supporting uh, either a nation or a group of nations. Uh, but there's mm -hmm. so much that goes into managing the personalities, managing, uh, you know, like the pod system that we talked about, uh, such things as how many captains picks. Uh, what are some of the elements that you learned in writing this that perhaps the casual golf fan wouldn't know that the captains actually have purview over? Yeah, I, I compare it to being a CEO where you have responsibility over everything. You may not handle everything directly, but everything eventually comes to you and you do have to like it's a two year job at this point. So, yeah, it, it, I'll, I'll say this, like a big thing I learned is that on both sides, you benefit from a system being in place that you can mm -hmm. learn from. A big concept um, that this guy, Jason Aquino, introduced me to, he's the head of Scouts Consulting, which is the data and analytics group that the U.S. now hires to help them prepare for Ryder Cups uh, and President's Cups. Uh, and he, he called it institutional memory. Hmm. And that's a fancy way of just saying we learn from our successes and we learn from our failures because we have a continuous system in place. It is not, oh, two years later, it's a completely new captain with a new philosophy and a new everything. It is now something where everything is continuous. The, the captain who is now captaining the Ryder Cup will have served as vice captain, not just in the Ryder Cup, but he'll have served as an assistant or even a head captain in the President's Cup. Mm -hmm. Everything rotates in, and so they keep learning. And so what that means is that you're not struck with uncertainty when some situation comes up because in all likelihood you've got an example from the past mm -hmm. and you can learn how to you know either treat it the same way or do something differently because it didn't work. When you have captains diverge from that, well, for the longest time, the U.S. didn't have that, and that's what mm -hmm. handicapped them. Europe has had it for a long time. They've had captains diverge from it. Nick Faldo is a famous example. He was a disaster of a captain mm -hmm. uh, because he had a great system, but he was too arrogant to follow it. He had his own ideas. Parry Carrington is not arrogant. He's a very nice guy, and the players loved him. However, he's very much an independent thinker, and in certain cases, like the captain's picks or – you know, some stuff we saw with the balls where, where Fitzpatrick couldn't play with his partner and certain things, the preparation wasn't there because he had different ideas than had been proven successful mm. where Steve Stricker was, you know, he's a smart guy and he's got incredible attention to detail, but he followed the system and mm. the system, the U S system they've implemented is very good and it's been successful. Uh, so 
to answer your question, what kind of things do they do? I mean, everything from like the big stuff, like course setup, making right. captain's picks, constantly being in communication with your team because golfers like to know what they're going to do. They don't like surprises. They don't like to be told what their pairing is the day before. Stuff like that to picking out the uniforms, making sure that if it rains, you know, you've got clothes that, <laughs> you know, we've seen that in the past. Like things like that. Uh, it, it just goes down to like, how do I – you know, keep the families happy. Where are the wives going to be? What are the caddies going to do? Mm-hmm. Endless. There's just endless stuff, even like, you know, food and transport. It just goes down to the most fundamental details that you have to plan for. Um, but you've got a team around you to help you too. Yeah. It's, it's a massive job that uh, a lot of people probably don't even understand. And it's, it's yeah. one of those things where we continue to learn more and more about the different intricacies of a, a, a new captain while staying true to the system, if they choose to do so, as you uh, just illustrated. So as we talk more and we're getting up here uh, close to the clock and once again, uh, listeners are talking to Shane Ryan. He's the author of a new book, the cup they couldn't lose America, the Ryder cup and the long road to whistling straights. You spoke to so many different people, not just the golfers, to write this book. You spoke to families. You went and visited families. What is What was the reception that you received? Were they excited to tell you the stories that helped you know, shape their experience at the Ryder Cup? Yeah, for the most part, everybody was. Um, you know, it was it's, – it's like anything. You sometimes struggle to get people. There are people that – wouldn't talk to me for whatever reason, uh, just, you know, because maybe they didn't understand it or whatever. Somebody like Sam Torrance, I would have loved to have spoken with, but yeah, like you said, I mean, I tried to learn everything I could about Stricker. I went and visited his family in his hometown, people he knew. I kind of did, you know, the comprehensive Stricker story as much as I could. Um, and it was great. Yeah. For the most part, people were really receptive to this and, uh, I think they knew, you know, it's it's not like a you know negative story, really. Well, I sure. guess with U.S. Right. loss, it, it might have been, but uh, <laughs> but but no, I mean, it was you know very clear early on that they had a good thing going, and so you know it was like this. Um, uh, people were excited, you know. It's funny going into Wisconsin and like Lutheran Wisconsin. You know, it's like the people there are very different uh, yeah. than you might if you grew up like in New York mm-hmm. or whatever. So you know, you're talking to them and they're very, you know, stoic, very unbelievably nice people, but not, you know, you, you have to work to get something out yeah. of them. Yeah, can I but, but that tells you a lot too, right away. I mean, like Steve Stricker is somebody who just hates talking. He doesn't like mm-hmm. to talk, hates public speaking. I mean, that's a funny thing about him. Uh, so anyway, yeah, like getting to the bottom of all this was great. And yeah, for the most part, I found people uh, very, very willing to, to talk. What was the most rewarding part of this whole process for you writing this book? It's a good question. Um, well, I think from a personal standpoint – I studied the Ryder Cup to such a degree that when it was starting, I was going to write a prediction piece, right? And I mm-hmm. I felt like everything I'd learned about the Ryder Cup, I felt like I knew a lot. I felt like the U.S. was going to win in a blowout. And mm-hmm. it's, I'm not saying that's some great revelation, but I, I feel like I internalized this stuff to such a degree that I kind of like knew it was going to happen. And that was validating. Like if Europe had right. come out and won somehow, it would have been like, why did I not see this coming? How, how could this happen? Um, so there's like things like that where you feel like it's just in your bloodstream at a certain point And you know, like, I think the book's going to be pretty good because I've, I've done my homework and then some, um, yeah. And then in terms of you know, like, in terms of the reporting process, things like that, I just like it all. You know what I mean? Mm. Like going to Stricker's hometown was great. Talking to Parry Carrington was great. Um, Tony Jacklin, maybe Paul McGinley, like some of the like three hour conversations I had with these guys were like having history like revealed to you or in Paul McGinley's case, seeing how deep the captain's role is and how deeply he thinks about this stuff and being blown away by the intricacy of the plans. You're like, wow, oh my God. So that was all very satisfying. Yeah, just a pretty satisfying process in general. Nice, nice. Well, it's been satisfying to read it. I can't wait to finish it. It's a fantastic book. And Shane, you just do outstanding work. And just as a quick side note, your piece on the club pros that you just published recently, 100% is true. And we talked a little bit on Twitter regarding that whole thing. And we could talk more about it, I'm sure. But uh, you just have a knack that uh, not many writers have. And I genuinely mean that I will read anything you ever write. Uh, and I hope that the listeners will take my advice to do the same. The cup they couldn't <laughs> lose America, the Ryder cup and the long road to whistling straights. Shane, thanks so much for coming on. And I hope you sell a million of these. Yeah, man, we should talk more often. I appreciate it, Adam. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>